All right, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Most wonderful time of the year. Pastor Dylan mentioned that we have just about 200 people who are volunteering with the uh, stroll in the park, the Christmas stroll in the park, which is incredible. That is awesome. And he mentioned this last week that the, uh, the, the small groups really participated in an all hands on deck the halls at praise. Um, so really all of the Christmas decorations, everything you see around, everything on stage was done by our small groups here, which is incredible. Thank you so much um, just to them. That's super, super cool. Um, I do have just one thing I need to mention, and this may be in some people's mind blasphemy, <laughs> but for everything that goes up, it must also come down. And on January 2nd, uh, we need to take everything that went up. And I know it's way too early to be having this conversation. <laughs> but we have learned that if you don't plan from the beginning for how you're going to take stuff back down, that it ends up just being a couple people doing it. And, and so on January 2nd, we're going to have our Grinch Day. And that's a Tuesday night. Okay, and that is the taking back down of all of the stuff that went back up. So it's a all hands on undeck the halls, whatever you want to call it, Grinch Day, all hands on undeck the halls. Um, but we are that, we're going to have some fun stuff planned. And if you would join us for that, there is in the message notes right at the top a link for you to sign up. And the first five people to sign themselves and one other person up. The first five will get some Oh Holy Nog. How many of you know what Oh Holy Nog is in Springfield? This is a thing. It made the news this last year. This is from Kingdom Coffee. This is eggnog infused with espresso. This is so ridiculously good that I cannot open it and drink it for myself because it will not stop, okay? So if you are interested, the first five, we've had some people sign up, but nobody signed themselves up and somebody else, as far as we can tell. Um, but we will, the first five to sign themselves up and one other person. They don't have to know you signed them up. You do have to get them there on January 2nd, okay? So the first five, and we already have them purchased. You can pick them up today, okay? So make sure to get them. But I have one right here, coffee-infused eggnog, oh, holy nog, from Kingdom Coffee. And I want to give this to Grady. Grady, where you at? Grady, this is Grady's last Sunday. Grady, this one's for you. I hope you're not allergic to eggs or nogs. Um, but this is his, thank you very much, Grady. Congratulations. Enjoy. You can drink it now. Um, there's nothing else in there besides coffee, I'm pretty sure. So, um, but this is his last Sunday with us as an intern at Praise. And uh, I guess I'm going to have to get my own pulpit from now on, bring it up myself. And, but we've, we've enjoyed all of our interns this, this fall. Um, but, but it's coming to the end of that semester, even as we're moving into the Christmas season. So we decked our own halls at home. And as part of that, Liz went and got some eggnog from the store. And when she brought it home, I saw the carton, and it was by Southern Comfort. <laughs> and I don't know if you know this about Liz, but she was raised well by Lynette. And so she may not know what Southern Comfort is. Uh, but so I said... Uh, so we looked at it, and it did say alcohol-free. So, so they sell it, apparently. Southern Comfort sells eggnog for cheaper so that you will buy other things to infuse it with. And so we were like, oh, yeah, let's get that, because it was cheaper than all the other. And it was pretty good, too, that eggnog. And so, um, but I love that time of year when all of the things that don't come out any other time of year come out. Eggnog is one of them, the Christmas tree. When you open up your Christmas closet and all the stuff gets puked out, and <laughs> you're like setting it up and going through the whole process. Some of you are like, oh, man, this is the worst. Somebody told me this week, I won't say who it is, said a name, but they said, why would I do something where I, ha I know I'm just creating more work for myself? The decorating for Christmas thing. Because you know you got to take it back down, that there is a January 2nd Grinch Day, always, anytime you put something up. But for me, 
As I think about Christmas and all the things that only come out at Christmas, there is the eggnog, which I mentioned. Last year, we got Liz a, an advent calendar. I got Liz an advent calendar. That's one of those exit uh, escape games. You guys seen these? These are super cool. Every day of December, she gets to open it up, and there's like a little puzzle inside that she gets to solve. Um, and so if you've ever done one of those exit games, they have an advent calendar for all the month of December. This is when our kids get their advent calendars and there's little gifts every single day. This is when the Christmas movies come out. For us, every Friday through December, we are watching different Christmas movies. We won't tell you which ones, but, but the Christmas movies come out. This is when the ugly Christmas sweaters come out, the candy canes come out, the fruitcakes. Anybody in here like fruitcake? Yeah, see? That's gingerbread houses. This is when uh, everything that is Christmas happens. The stuff that only happens at Christmas happens this month. It's officially December, and it is time for us at the Beauchamp household. You might not hear the word tradition one time all through the year until you get to Christmas. And as soon as you hit December, like you hear it 10 times a day. Well, that's not the tradition. That's not the tradition. That's not the tradition. And then Liz gets really tired of me saying that. You know, and like, like it's just that time of the year when everything becomes tradition focused. For us, one of the big things at Praise is, that is a tradition is our Christmas Eve service. This is one of my favorite services of the year. This year, we're doing it as well. If you don't know, Christmas Eve is on a Sunday. We are not having service on Sunday morning. We will be having service on Sunday night, Christmas Eve, and it is going to be very, very special, and we're very excited about that because that is a part of what we do every single year. And so for you, if your family is in, which many of you will have family in on Christmas Eve, invite them to join us for that very, very special service. It's always incredibly special. This is also the time of year, at least for me, when we read all of the very specific passages in Scripture. On, on Christmas Eve, there's, there's some Scriptures that we don't get into as we lead up to Christmas because we save them, especially for Christmas Eve. But there are certain passages, even in the Bible, where, where maybe they're passages that we only read at Christmas, that we only bust out during that time of the year as we're approaching uh, the celebration of Jesus' birth, and they're appropriate for us to do so. And so today I want to read just a few of those to you as we're going through our Advent series. And so I, I'm going to go to two of the most beautiful passages that we quote all of the time, and they're both in Isaiah. And the reason why is Isaiah, maybe more than any other prophet, I mean, they all were talking about Jesus, but Isaiah really zeroed in on a few things in particular, and especially with Jesus' birth and what it meant that God was coming to be with us. And so those passages that we always read, of course, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, love this verse. All right, then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, and she will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel which means God is with us. God is with us. That means something. It means something that God is with us. Another passage, of course, is just a couple chapters later in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We just sang that. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this Happened. He will be, he says, the prince of peace. The prince of peace. His government will be one in which there is perfect justice, but also absolute and perfect peace. These are some of the most incredible promises that you find about Jesus' coming. And as I read them and think about the prince of peace and the, the government of peace, the, where peace is, is eternal and his reign is 
eternal. I can't help but think of that night, Christmas night, when Jesus is laying in the manger and maybe Joseph and Mary are over in the corner sleeping with a lamb as a pillow or whatever that looked like. But that moment, that oh holy night, that oh peaceful night, it is a time of peace. But this passage is not just for moments of peace when it's already peaceful. The promise of the Prince of Peace is not just for those who are already in a state of peace. It is for those who are not. This last week was incredibly stressful. And actually, this next week is going to be stressful as well. Um, because we are approaching the end of the semester. If you don't know, I mentioned it as many times as I possibly can, but um, I went back to school this year, and as part of going back to school, this semester was just so much. Like, so I am finishing up a paper that is longer than any paper I've had to write in my life, okay? And this is just the new norm for me for the next four years. And I'm thinking about that, and I'm looking forward to more of the same and how much writing is going to be a part of it. And I'm just like, this is that moment when it's coming due. It's due this next week. It's also, if you don't know, an incredibly dangerous time. This is a dangerous time. How many grandmothers do we have in here? If you're a grandmother, raise your hand. Okay? Keep your hand up. No, 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 don't put it back down. If you are a grandmother, keep your hand up. Okay, if you are a grandmother whose grandchild is in college, keep your hand up. If you are a grandmother and your grandchild is in college, this is an incredibly dangerous time for you. If you don't know, there are studies that have shown that this is perhaps the most dangerous time of the year for you. A study was done on this because there was a professor at one point who started noticing a trend. That every year, as they approached finals and or as they approached final exams or papers being due, that there was a rash of deaths of students' relatives right at the end of the semester leading up to those exams. And guess which relative was most likely to die? Grandma. I'm, I'm not kidding. This is not, I'm not making this up. This is real. So this professor decided to do a study. So he did a study. Rather than going out to the federal government and finding out, you know, what the statistics say, he decided to survey professors all over the United States for two years for them to keep track of this specific thing. And that research showed from the professors around the U.S. that grandmothers are 10 times more likely to die before a midterm <laughs> and 19 times more likely to die before a final exam. <laughs> Worse, grandmothers of students who are not doing well in class <laughs> are at a higher risk. Students who are failing are 50 times more likely to lose their grandma <laughs> than non-failing students. So, it turns out that the greatest predictor of mortality among senior citizens in our day is your grandchild's GPA. <laughs> and I think, I think the moral of the story is if your grandparent, if you're a grandparent, do not let your grandchild go to college if they aren't particularly good at school. <laughs> I'm just saying. So this is a dangerous time. It's also a very stressful time. People in college, people who are even in high school and you're approaching end of the semester and you've got stuff due or you've got exams that are coming up and you're thinking about all those things. It's just a time of stress. For me, both of my grandmothers have already passed away. And so um, I, I'm, I'm super stressed and, um, and yet I keep reminding my, or remembering, not reminding myself. Somebody told me at one point that this degree is a terminal degree which I think means that you can't get more after your doctorate, right? Like you could go and get a PhD, but that this is a terminal degree. It's supposed to be the end of the road. I hope with everything inside of me, it doesn't mean that it's terminal for me. I don't know that for sure, but I'm, so as I'm looking at that and I'm thinking about all this and all of the stress that's associated with it, knowing that just here in about a week, everything's gonna change. 
But all that stress was just tearing me up inside. Like I'm just, and I just did what I always do when I get to that point where, where I'm just stressed. I did what scripture tells me to do. I just began to cast my cares upon God. I prayed. And if you don't know, I've said this before, this is what I literally do. When I'm at the point where I know I can't do anything about it, and all I can do is trust him and walk the path that's in front of me, every time all of those things begin to stir up inside of me, I literally will cast my cares on him. As I'm praying, I will just take those things in my hand and visualize myself just casting them onto him. They are no longer my cares, they are his cares. And the thing about peace that is promised to us is that it is promised in the midst of stressful moments. It's promised to us in difficult times. It's promised to us when it's not just Christmas night, oh holy night, when the stars are brightly shining. It is also promised to us when Herod is coming for Jesus when they are fleeing to Egypt. The same Prince of Peace is the Prince of Peace there as in the O Holy Night. And for us, even today, you may even feel some of that same stress or have things stirred up inside of you. And I just would just remind you that when these prophecies were given, was an incredibly dark time. This prophecy was given in 735 B.C. or right around there. And it had been just a prosperous time. Everything had been going well. The king up to, just before this, was Uzziah, who was considered one of the greatest kings in Judah, specifically. But 735 B.C. was like 10 kings after Solomon had died and the nation had split and and yet, as much as things had been good during Uzziah, his, his, the, the nation had grown. It has expanded. He had conquered the nations around Judah, and, and everything had grown. But at the same time, the prophets had begun to prophesy that things were about to turn. The first of the prophets, Isaiah and Amos and Micah and Hosea, had started writing that things were about to get really, really hairy. And specifically, they were prophesying about Assyria in the north. Because Assyria was growing in power, it was a concern. And right around that time, a king comes to the throne whose name was Ahaz. And Ahaz, his story is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 28. And I want to read just a little bit about it. Because this is the background to these incredible prophecies which... We quote every single Christmas. And I love this story, not because it's a fun story, because what it says about our God who sent his son to us. Second Chronicles chapter 28, Ahaz becomes king in Judah. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he ruled in Jerusalem for 16 years. He did not do what was pleasing in the sight of the Lord as his ancestor David had done. Instead, he followed the example of the kings of Israel. He cast metal images for the worship of Baal, and he offered sacrifices in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, even sacrificing his own sons in the fire. In this way, he followed the detestable practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burned incense at the pagan shrines and on the hills and under every green tree. This is about as bad of an indictment as you can get against a king, especially in Judah of the line of David. It says he walked in the ways of the kings of the north in Israel where things were not submitted to God. It was not of the line of David. And it says that he even offered sacrifices of his own sons. He is not the first of the kings of Judah to worship Baal. He is not the first of the kings of Judah to worship at the high places, which was all forbidden. He was not the first to worship under every green tree, but he was the very first king of Judah who sacrificed his own sons. He wasn't the last, but he was the first. And he 
That may have been to the god Molech, or it may have been to the god Baal. He may have sacrificed his sons to both of those. I, we don't know exactly, and we're not even sure what caused him to do that, because that's not normally what you lead with when you're worshiping a god. Like, you don't start with, that's not the initiation. No one would serve that god. Normally, it was when there was no other way to, where to turn, that's the extent that somebody who had no other hope would turn to, right? Like, there's a, there's a story of the king of Moab in 2 Kings chapter 3, where he's trapped in his capital city, and he's surrounded by actually Judah and Israel, the people of Judah and Israel, and they're, they're pressing in on him. And so he, in order to save himself and save his kingdom, he sacrifices his son to the God in order to show just how serious he is. Like that's not, it's not something you do on the front end, right? It's not something where you're just getting started with an idol that you begin with child sacrifice. Typically, that was, if it would happen at all, it was the last resort of somebody who had no other hope, okay? So, so if there was an idol, typically how it would begin, you would begin by setting the idol up and you would provide for the idol. Like you would give it some little food here or there. And, and, and in that way, the idea was you were making that idol beholden to you. Like that God owed you something because you were taking care of that God. And so after you did that for a while, then, then the God would have to bless you. But as things get worse and worse and worse, no longer is that God serving you. Now you are totally beholden to it. And that's how it still works to this day with idolatry. It starts with just a little thing here or there. And then before you know it, that thing owns you completely and you will do whatever it takes and sell yourself completely. And that's what happens to him. Now, we don't know exactly what brings him to that point. It doesn't tell us. We do know that things start turning against Judah. Judah was in its like, not golden years, but it's considered it's like silver years at this point. The golden years were David and Solomon. But after Uzziah, that was a time of like agricultural and technological advancement and growth for the nation. But all of a sudden, everything turns during Ahaz's reign. And it turns quickly. We don't have time to read it today, but I'm going to skip a bunch. From verse 5 down to verse 15, it kind of tells you that um, the nations in the north, Syria and Israel form an alliance against Judah, and they come and they attack. And the reason why they do that is because even further north, the nation of Assyria is growing as a threat. And so they try to form an alliance with the three of them, Syria, Israel, and Judah. But Judah, the king Ahaz, realizes this is a bad idea because Ahaz was apparently pretty smart. He says, this is a bad idea. You're not going to do it. And so he says, I'm not joining the alliance. So the two nations to the north decide, okay, well, if he's not going to join the alliance, we need to take him out first before we turn against Assyria, right? So, so they decide to attack Judah, and they do. They come south. They attack. It's, it's the king Pekah of, of Israel and Rezin of Syria. They get in league. They attack Judah. When they do, they defeat him. They kill one of Ahaz's sons. They kill his commanders. They kill his number two in command of Judah. And then they carry off a bunch of captives. Okay, so things aren't going well. But then on top of that, at the exact same time, starting in verse 16, reading down to about verse 19, it says, as soon as that happens, the other nations around begin to sense blood in the water. And so Edom in the south and east begins to attack from the south and east. And at the same time that that's happening and they're pressing in from the south and east, the Philistines in the west go, well, this is a good opportunity. And they begin to attack from the west. So officially, at this point then, Judah is attacked on all four sides. North, south, east, and west. And on every side, they are losing. It is essentially the incredible shrinking kingdom. The kingdom is shrinking right in front of Ahaz's eyes. He is in a room with the walls caving in. So he sends off to Assyria to help. He says, hey, we're getting attacked. 
Will you come and help us? Verse 20 says, here's what happens next. So when the king, Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria, arrived, he attacked Ahaz instead of helping him. And so Ahaz took valuable items from the Lord's temple, the royal palace, and from the homes of his officials and gave them to the king of Assyria as tribute. But this did not help him. So that doesn't work. So what does he try next? Even during this time of trouble, King Ahaz continued to reject the Lord. He offered sacrifices to the gods of Damascus who had defeated him. For he said, since these gods helped the kings of Aram or Aram, they will help me too if I sacrifice to them. But instead, they led to his ruin and the ruin of all Judah. So Ahaz says, hey man, it worked for Damascus. I should really be worshiping their gods. So not only is Ahaz smart, because he was right, Assyria will come through and wipe the floor with all of them here before too, too long. He knows what he's talking about. He's also a pragmatist. Pragmatism is, whether it's right or not, if it works, I'll do it. Whether it's the right move or not, doesn't matter. If it works, then it's good. We'll just go for it. So as a pragmatist, he looks and he sees, well, the, the gods of Damascus helped him to defeat me, so I'm going to go ahead and begin to worship them. So what is he doing? He is pushing every button he knows to push, and nothing seems to be working. What's really interesting about Ahaz is that his name was not actually Ahaz. His name was actually Jehoahaz. Jehoahaz, which means God holds you. Somewhere along the line, and we don't know where, he changes his own name and removes God, Jeho, and just becomes a has. And a has, if you remove God from it, just means he grasps. So his name was, God holds me. When he removes God, he becomes the one who is grasping. And that's exactly what Ahaz is doing. He is pushing every button. He is grasping at every straw, trying to turn this thing around that he cannot turn around. And then it says, he becomes aware that the nations of the north have decided to come south one last time. And this time, they are coming for Ahaz. So this is Israel and Syria have said, we're going to replace him on the throne. And when we do, when we do, then they will join with us against Assyria. And we know that because that's what Isaiah tells us in that passage we just read. And so I want to flip back over there to Isaiah chapter 7. Because this story or this Prophecy is actually a prophecy given to Ahaz by Isaiah. So here's the background, and I'm going to lead right up to the verse. I'm going to start in verse 1, read all the way down to verse 14. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, the grandson of Uzziah, was king of Judah, king Rezin of Syria, and Pekah, son of Ramalia, the king of Israel, set out to attack Jerusalem. However, they were unable to carry out their plan. The news had come to the royal court of Judah. Syria is allied with Israel against us. So the hearts of the king and his people trembled with fear like trees shaking in the storm. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Take your son, Shear Jeshub, and go out to meet King Ahaz. You will find him at the end of the aqueduct that feeds water into the upper pool near the road leading to the field where cloth is washed. So Isaiah is told by God to take his son to go meet with Ahaz, the king, right in this kind of a key strategic location. So Ahaz is probably out checking the fortifications in preparation for the invasion they all know is coming. And so he's checking to make sure that the, if the city is going to be sieged, that the water supply is, is, is going to be solid. And, and so Ahaz is there inspecting it. And that's where Isaiah goes. And whether he knew Ahaz would be there or not, God did. So he shows up, and there is Ahaz. And it says, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, 
Uh, sorry, let me say, uh, actually down in verse 4. Tell him to stop worrying. Tell him he doesn't need to fear the fierce anger of these two burned out embers, King Rezin of Syria and Pekah son of Ramalia. Yes, the kings of Syria and Israel are plotting against him, saying, we will attack Judah and capture it for ourselves. Then we will install the son of Tabeel as Judah's king. So Isaiah says, or God tells Isaiah to say, don't be afraid of Pekah and Rezin, because even though they've plotted your ruin and they're planning on dividing Judah between them, don't worry, because in reality, they are two smoldering stubs of firewood. I mentioned to you earlier this year that I had to cut down an important tree to me, that ash tree that sat right in front of our house that we love because it provides shade. And I have to say that front of our house has been way sunnier and we get way more sun in from the windows. And it bums me out every time because that sun or that tree used to provide shade. But once we cut the tree down, I realized I probably shouldn't stop there. There were some other trees that I need to clear out as well. And so I cleared those trees out as well just because there were trees that were kind of a little too close to our house. They had started growing to the point where I'm like, man, just for the sake of safety, I got to get these things away from them. So as a result, I'd cut down so many trees. Uh, there was like five trees after it was all said and done. I'm like, I don't want to lose one tree, but now I'm going to lose five. So after I cut them down, I cut them up and I stacked them. And here's a picture of the stacked wood from those trees. Now, it doesn't look that big. There's actually more wood on the other side of it as well. Um, and uh, even as I look at that stack of wood, you see, we don't heat our house with wood. Um, we have uh, geothermal heating and cooling. And, and yet, during certain times of the year when it's just so bitterly cold, there is nothing like having a fire in the fireplace. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And for those of you who burn wood, you know that it is, in some ways, the most miserable thing ever. <laughs> I'm saying it's a lot of work, but you wouldn't have it any other way. Right? That's the thing for people who burn wood. They're like, man, this is so much work as you're splitting wood, cutting wood, bringing the wood in. Every time it's so cold and you go outside in order to get more wood and bring it in. It's a lot of work. And a lot of times it's miserable, and you wouldn't have it any other way. That's what it is for me. Now, I have wood that is prepared for this year. It's split. This is wood that's too green in order to burn. But when I look at that wood, you know what I think of? I think of that bitter, cold morning when it is so cold and windy outside and the snow is blowing across, and inside the fire in the fireplace is just perfect. And we're all nice and roasty and cozy. See, when I look at that stack of firewood, this is stuff at some point I need to split, right? That's going to be a lot of work. And I know it's going to be a lot of work. But even still, when I see a stack of firewood like that, I think of potential. That is to me, when I see that, I think of that cozy, warm day and the fire going, that's what that stack of firewood looks like. Now, when I cut that tree up, there was some that was too big to split. At least for me, I don't know how to split it. Some of you might, and if you do, please send me a message. But these suckers were huge, and I'm like, I'm not splitting that. So I took my tractor, chained it around the bucket, brought it out in the woods, and I dropped it. You can see it right over the edge. In fact, I'm going to zoom in on it. Those things are beautiful logs, and every day when I pull out of my driveway and I look towards that beautiful stack of wood, I see incredible potential. And then I glance just a little bit off to the right, and I see these beautiful logs sitting out in the woods, and they taunt me. And I think, those, woods, those, those logs sitting out in the woods are going to rot and all that potential is going to go to waste. And they taunt me. So if a stack of firewood is potential, if rotting firewood is wasted potential, what is a 
burned out ember. It is exhausted potential. It has already been burned, and there is nothing left. What God says here to Ahaz is, these two nations to your north, stop worrying about them. There is not much left. In fact, he continues on. He says to them, these are nations which are near their end. He says, you see the threat. What I see is exhausted potential. There is nothing left. He continues and he says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. This invasion will never happen. It will never take place. For Syria is no stronger than its capital, Damascus, and Damascus is no stronger than its king, Rezin. And as for Israel, within 65 years, it will be crushed and completely destroyed. Israel is no stronger than its capital, Samaria, and Samaria is no stronger than its king, Pinka, Pika, son of Ramalia. Unless your faith is firm, I cannot make you to stand firm. God says all that's left of these nations is their capital. All that's left of these capitals is their king. And these kings are just plain not that strong. There's not much left to them at all. And he says, within 65 years, Israel will be so destroyed that you will not even be able to call the people who are living there a people of God anymore. They won't be Israel. In case you're wondering, that is exactly what happens. Assyria wipes the floor with Aram and Israel two years later in 732 B.C., deporting many of the citizens. Eleven years after that, in 721, they come back and completely destroy the northern kingdom, carrying off even more. By 669 B.C., they come through one last time for final deportations and settling those people all over the place, which is exactly 65 years after the prophecy was given. It happens exactly as God says it will. The people who are left there are too shattered to even be called a people. So God makes that promise to him. And then he says, unless your faith is firm, I cannot make you stand firm. ESV says, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. God says, I know this looks bad. I know it feels like everything is crumbling, because it is. But don't look to your surroundings. Look to me. Because if you don't look to me in faith, you won't survive at all. Verse 10. Later, the Lord sent this message to King Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign of confirmation, Ahaz. Make it as difficult as you want. As high as the heaven or as deep as the place of the dead. But the king refused. No, he said, I will not test the Lord like that, which sounds really spiritual, right? Like he's quoting from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, do not test the Lord your God. And so he says, I'm not going to test the Lord my God. I'm not supposed to test the Lord my God. And I guess you could say Ahaz is spiritual, but remember he sacrificed his son to Molech. So like it's not the right kind of spiritual. He's just trying to appear pious here. He has no relationship with God. But God tells him, ask for whatever sign you want, as high as you want, as deep as you want, whatever, I'm willing to show it to you. He says, I'm not going to test God. So then Isaiah responds, listen well, you royal family of David. Now, I don't know if you caught this, but as far as I can tell, up until this point, God had told Isaiah exactly what to say. Now, Isaiah is ticked. He said, You don't want to test the Lord your God? What do you think you were doing? And he goes off. And in fact, if you pay attention, he's no longer even talking to Ahaz here. He stops talking to Ahaz and begins to talk to the entire line of David. Watch. Then Isaiah said, Listen well, you royal family of David. Isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust the patience of my God as well? All right, then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. 
the most beautiful, incredible prophecy speaking to the coming of God, God with us, Emmanuel, is given to a king who does not deserve it. Ahaz is one of the worst kings of Judah, if not the worst. And yet it's to him that God makes this promise. Matthew quotes it and says this is obviously about Jesus Christ. But Ahaz instead decides to send off to the king of Assyria again. And he says to the king of Assyria, I will become your vassal if you will come and save us. And so the king of Assyria does. And from then on, Judah becomes the vassal of Assyria, and then the vassal of Babylon, and then the vassal of Persia, and then the vassal of the Greeks, and then the vassal of the Romans. And right in the middle of this story, is this incredible promise from God to this terrible king. And it is one of the most beautiful prophecies of the coming of Jesus Christ. And for the longest time, I wondered, why in the world would God give such an incredible promise to such a despicable king? Why would God give such a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ coming to a king who is all over the map. And then, about six, seven years ago, I realized. It's because of verse 6. When the king Rezin and king Pekah came up with a plan, they said, we will attack Judah and capture it for ourselves. Then we will install the son of Tabeel as Judah's king. We have no idea who Tabeel is. It sounds like an Aramean name, but we don't know for sure. What we do know is this. He is not of the line of David. And so these two kings have come up with a plan that flies directly in the face of God's plan. And God's plan is based on a promise that he had made to David 300 years earlier, saying that he and his descendants will sit on the throne. If their plan succeeds, then the line of David is cut off. If their plan succeeds, the house of David ends. And that cannot happen because Jesus Christ is of that line. In fact, Ahaz, this despicable king, if you look in Matthew, he is sitting there as one of the ancestors of Jesus. And so Pekah and Rezin have no idea that they have wandered into dangerous territory, that their plan flies directly in the face of God's plan. And so Ahaz receives a promise from God Do not worry, he says to Ahaz. Nothing will happen to you. He says, ask for a sign. Ahaz says, I'm not going to ask for a sign. And then God gives him one anyways. Here's your sign. The virgin will give birth to a son. And that son will be God with us, Emmanuel. So Ahaz, the pragmatist, the grasper of straws, the button pusher, going for everything he can as his nation shrinks, would only be king for 16 years. When the Syrians' gods that he worshipped because they helped the Syrians to defeat him, they don't defend the Syrians against the Assyrians in two years. And so Assyria comes through and all of them lose. And I read this story, and as much as I think Ahaz is such a despicable king, I think also... I feel bad for him because I read his story and I just cannot help but feel the enormous pressure he must have been under. The enormous pressure that he must have been feeling every day as his nation shrank on his watch. He is losing in every sense of leading and he's looking to silver bullet after silver bullet to to save it all. And then right in the middle of that, God has given him a sign that everything will be okay. And here's the thing I wonder. Did Ahaz 
sacrifice his son before or after God's promise? At what point did he get so close to the end of his rope that he burned his own son as a sacrifice? When was it? Was it before or after God told him it's going to be okay? Like at what point did he come to the end where he was willing to do whatever it took? Because we know he didn't pay attention to the prophecy. We know he didn't respond as God told him to respond. But I just wonder, I wonder if his son's life had, might have been saved if he would have listened. And I don't know. Maybe it was before, maybe it's after. But he doesn't listen. And things get darker and darker and darker. And so, a little while later, Isaiah comes with another prophecy. Isaiah chapter 9, and part of that is verse 6 and 7. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. Peace. He is the prince of peace. It's easy to look back at Ahaz's story and to think, what was he thinking? But I... I also know at least some of what he must have been feeling. And I think others do too. Because there's this moment, and some of you have felt it before, or maybe you're feeling it now, or you will at some point in the future, where it feels like the walls are closing in. You know, like where, where everything, it just seems to be pressing more and more and more against you. And you're just scrambling to make something happen, to try to turn it around, right? And so you start swinging for the fence on every swing. Like you're trying every silver bullet. You're working the system. You're hustling. Like you're doing everything you can. The promise of Christmas is peace. The promise of Christmas is when you are in the middle of a situation like that. You may not know exactly how it's going to turn out, but the promise of Christmas is that when you look at Jesus in the manger, that that should speak to you of the fact that God is with us, that it should be for you a sign. There's two words that are used in, in Isaiah for, for things like a sign. There's another one that shows up in, I read it last week, Isaiah 11, where it talks about a banner and, and, and that word for banner is, is referring to the cross of Jesus Christ, that as you look at it, you will be saved, right? So when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, it communicates to us God's sacrifice for us. But then there's the manger, and Jesus in the manger is a sign to us. It is something that speaks to the fact that God is working in ways that we do not see and that he sees things that we never will be able to, or at least not until the other side of eternity. And so as we look at the baby, Jesus in the manger, God coming, leaving his throne and being among us, even as we are pressed on every side, as, a, as we've been trying and trying and trying and trying and nothing is landing and we feel like we're grasping at straws or pushing every button and we've done all that we can to do and yet the walls continue to close in, that even still in the midst of that, there is peace. If, if we stand firm in our faith, we stand firm in our faith. And just this morning as I was reading this passage again and praying over it, I just believe the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said that there is somebody who is here today who has been 
in a situation just like this. And they feel like, why should I keep holding to my faith when God hasn't answered my prayers? And the response is what Isaiah said to Ahaz, or God said to Ahaz. If you don't stand in faith, you won't stand at all. Hear that message again. If you don't stand in faith, you won't stand at all. That the faith is the only thing that is causing you to stand at all. So don't let go of that. Otherwise, it all comes crumbling down. If you don't stand in faith, you won't stand at all. As I was reading this story and the peace that is offered in the midst of this situation and reflecting on this verse, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. I think there are some people who want the peace without the prince, who want the kingdom without the king. But those two things cannot be separated. The peace comes as a result of the prince. The kingdom comes as a result of the king. And so the peace that is available to us in the midst of whatever our circumstances are, and whatever the stresses are, and whatever difficulty we're going through, is a direct result of our first surrender to him as our prince and our king, but then second, obedience to him. I'm, I'm just so convinced of that. This week in particular, there was something, oh man, this is not the type of thing to be as a pastor saying. I was, I was in disobedience to something that the Lord had spoken to me when I was on my spiritual retreat. There was something he told me I needed to do, and I didn't do it. I thought, well, it can't really be that big of a deal, right? Like, just because he told me to do it doesn't mean he really expects me to do it, right? I know, yes, yes. That's what you want in your pastor. So, but I'm just being open. This is where I was. And it's not a, I didn't think at the time, it was like just not a big thing. It was a very specific thing though, that he told me, I want to see this change in your life. And I wasn't doing it. And for two months, I haven't been doing it. And then this week specifically, God spoke to me and said, Alan, the reason why you don't have peace is because you're in disobedience. You have not done the thing that I have told you to do. Man, that conviction. I repented and I said, oh God, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. And I did what he asked me to do. And I will tell you, that there is no more peaceful place than to be in obedience to God. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the God who said, I offer peace to you, but I must be the Prince in order for you to have that peace. It must be my government through which, my governing of your heart, through which that peace will be eternal for you. Obedience is necessary. And for Ahaz, man, like I know exactly what that is. Like that, even that name, Jehoahaz, he was meant to be the one who is held by God. But because he removed God from that, he became, he still needed to be secure. So what is he doing? He's grasping at everything. I mean, how perfect of a picture is it of what it's like when we remove God from our lives. We become the one from the one who was held by God to the one who is grasping at straws. That is exactly what it looks like for us. He is the Prince of Peace. For that peace, he must be the Prince.